everyone. This is Julian Torres with Behind Company Lines. Thank you so much for joining us today. We have Rishi Khanna, CEO of Stockwitz, the original social platform for individual investors and traders with over 6 million registered members and millions of monthly visitors. Rishi, I'm so excited to chat with you. As we mentioned before the show, not only excited about your journey as, as a CEO, as, as somebody who's been around companies, scaling companies, and really had a, has had a long insight into what that really means across different industries. But in particular to Stockwitz, also what it means now with, with how many trailers are adopting platforms, how many people are looking for kind of the, the next big stock or, or big play, or even just looking to diversify their portfolios. There's so many people getting involved today. But before we get into all that good stuff with Stockwitz, what were you doing before you joined the company? Hey, thanks for having me, Julian. Fun to be here. So, I mean, most of my career, I've been an entrepreneur and I've done a couple other startups before in my last 20 plus years in the world of tech. Immediately before I actually was my one, immediately before StockTwits was my kind of one foray into a large corporate public company. I was working in a company called SSNC, which is a, a big fund administrator and software platform in the institutional space. So that was, I was there for two years. But other than that, most of my career has been startups, either my own or early stage companies that then grew. So, yeah. Yeah. It's incredible to think about what you've seen and, and probably, I feel like a lot of companies have a prescriptive way that they grow. And, and if they focus on the right things that you can kind of see or predict how well that company will go through like scaling challenges or are being able to grow through a macro environment. And I'm curious to what, in your experience, really makes companies strong, resilient, what kind of factors or, or I don't know if it's personality, traits or types, what have you seen that companies have that are successful? Is it something with their operations, their teams? What have you seen that really makes companies being able to take on that scaling challenge? I mean, I think the foundation is the people, right? Yeah. That's where a lot of it starts. And every every company, or at least you can kind of segment by industries and stuff, are going to be different, right? Uh, yeah. How StockTwits is successful is very different than how an enterprise SaaS company might be successful and different than how a payments company might be different, uh, be successful. So, but the foundation there, the people, startups are hard, right? And it's not, uh, and, I, and I did my first startup in 99. I did my second one in 07. So uh, we We've had a we've had a nice run like in the last like 10 12 years of everyone's been talking about the easy money and but startups are hard and so that that foundational group of people the first isn't the first 10 20 50 i think make make yeah. the yeah make or break the company over the longer term and and then how you evolve and grow your people depending on your needs and depending on how you're growing and scaling so it starts with the people and it's hard you need the resilience you need the kind of that mentality to be able to fight through the hard times but it's not always up into the right which is what we hear about when we you know, always talk about the successes for every yeah. success there are more failures behind the scenes yeah yeah exactly yeah, I'm just curious, is there any like early mistakes that you made that you've learned from that other founders can either avoid or, or prepare for as they're looking to I, I focus on different parts of the business? Yeah, I think there's a couple categories. One I will start with is you gotta you got to figure out the right combination of people in that early team and you got to be able to find the right chemistries especially it's one thing if it's like maybe three friends coming together and starting a company and pulling in former colleagues and whatnot where you have relationships but oftentimes there are then people in the earlier days that are brought onto the team that don't have those relationships and don't have kind of that history to build upon and so i think you got to be very mindful of that and very mindful paying attention to how things are working at that level meaning you got to be able to accept that you're not going to get it all right if you're the founder or like the founder ceo in hiring if you have 100 percent batting average good for you but that's i don't think i've ever seen that and i think being able to be honest for the company for yourself for the people involved like being able to kind of make the decisions to keep the team healthy whatever the context of that team is so i think that's one there and then then i think the other side from a strategy product kind of world side is in the beginning, focus, right? And in the earliest days, in the smallest days, when you're two, three, four, five people, can you focus and can you find the right thing to focus on and, and make sure you don't get too distracted? We did a little bit in one of my last companies, I think. In the early days, we might have tried to do a little bit too much. And this it was an enterprise SaaS business. And, and we were catering to our clients more than we probably should have been in the, in the form of client X had one request, client 
Y had another request, Client Z had another request. And in the world of enterprise SaaS and big ticket, like kind of subscriptions and whatnot, you're like, oh, okay, we really want that $100,000 subscription or that $50,000 subscription. We'll build that. We'll build that. But that can quickly uh, take you down a slippery slope if you're not focused when you're small. As you obviously become bigger and bigger, then you have the resources maybe to handle that, manage that, but you still need focus in, in the earliest of days. So try not yeah. to lose them and try not to chase the short-term victory for losing the long-term war, maybe. Yeah, yeah, that, you know, it's a, it's a great point. And I'm, I'm curious if, if you've seen, obviously, we, we know in terms of macro trends, obviously, VC money is not as easily accessible and, and not as easily distributed as before. And, and founders, I think, are, are dealt with the challenge of operating really efficient businesses and, and understanding themselves really efficient or really in depth as well. Have you seen any other trends outside of VC money kind of, not, I don't want to say drying up, but just being a little bit more guarded in, in terms of its distribution? What other trends have you seen in kind of the startup landscape? We've also seen no-code platforms come into fruition and other things kind of enabling kind of velocity of startups. But what else have you seen in terms of how the landscape has shifted prior COVID and then even kind of post last year and, and with the current events going on today? Yeah, and, and I think we're still, one, one of the things I'm going to comment on, I think we're still in the midst of it because, you know, sure. now with the kind of macro downward trend there, it's kind of come up place, but it is the concept of remote first companies and being remote, right? So yeah. I've spent most of my career not being remote, right? Being in offices and while we've had global teams at places I've worked, everyone was in an office in a different city. And so it's, we went at the, in COVID, right? We obviously, everyone went remote, but we remained remote first. And then we ended up hiring with that philosophy. And so today we're in 18 states and eight countries, and we don't really have any concentration of it in any city where we have an office per se. We have a couple offices here and there, but very small groups of folks. And that, that's been a challenge, I think, for me personally, just from a stylistic perspective. But, you know, you get the, I get asked the question around culture and how do you kind of stay right. connected? And we just had a global offsite. So we brought most of the team together, which was pretty awesome. A lot of us meeting for the first time in person. But um, I think that learning and how does that change your ability to operate, your ability to hire great team members and scale? That's why we did it. We got better access to Hattel when we looked beyond New York City alone, which is where we were based. And so being able to look beyond yeah. and, and find talent, I think that's that's a big aspect of kind of tech and startup world kind of going forward, how we adapt to that. Obviously, right now we're seeing, I, mean, I, think, I think I saw today more announcements that like Meta is having people come back to the, or, or suggesting people make more time to be in the office and whatnot. So we know where that's gonna lead to, right? right. Uh, so I, I think that's a, that's a big one. Um, Beyond the things that you already mentioned, I do. I'm, I'm passionate about operational efficiency and operational controls, and yeah. and not being crazy. So it's it's good to see some some discipline potentially returning to the space. A, yeah, yeah, discipline. I also think about it like the, the companies are looking a lot more mature in in regards to the understanding of the P and Ls and also their their LTVs, their CACs, and, and and really just keeping a lot of those things in consideration when thinking about raising money or, or bringing on partnerships or going through acquisitions and things like that. I, I love to see that. And in regards to the moving to remote work for the other founders who have done that or transitioned through that, who are still going through the growing pains of it, where what was the biggest challenge you saw and how did you overcome in regards to transitioning a workforce? Was it culture? Was it finding out how to pay people across the globe or find different tax laws? What, what in particular was, was like challenging for other founders out there and how did you overcome it? I think that we're fortunate. We live in a time there's a lot of good tools to manage it, right? With From like payroll and that kind of stuff we have both for our US base, but as well as our international. Those were very solvable problems. I think the, the, the challenge I was the most concerned about, and I still am today, yeah. is kind of keeping the cohesion and connectedness of kind of the team and the mission and what we're doing and like not losing sure. losing the sense of strategy and urgency because you're not connected as much, right? So how do you how do you keep that channel open? And we're still figuring out this was actually one of the big things that came up at the offsite because it was great for all of us to be in the same place physically. And we're like, how do we keep this going? Because the connection and being able to disseminate information but in a more impactful way is I think the biggest thing we think about when when COVID first happened for a multitude of reasons. We were a smaller organization, but we did what what I call two a days. We had a 
full team meeting every day, five days a week, twice a day. So wow. we had a morning one around 11 a.m., call it, and which was more like a stand-up kind of thing. Uh, and then we had like a 4, uh, 4 p.m. afternoon kind of check-in, which was more like a mental health and like, how are we doing in this crazy COVID time? We don't do that anymore. That, that's a little, that would be a little crazy, but we did that for probably a year or a little less than a year. But we do still do a full company meeting every Monday morning. We have a little over 60 folks on the team now, but you know, some people will say, hey, it's not particularly effective and it's not necessarily meant to be a meeting about action items and stuff like that. Rather, it's to keep everyone connected or try to keep that connection because that connection then helps us make decisions faster, connect faster. And as we've grown as well, how do we make sure we don't create artificial bureaucracy as a result of it remoteness and too much process because, okay, well, we can't just walk up and go to your desk. So let's put a process in place. Like that's what we got to avoid yeah. again for our scale, our size. If we were 500 people, maybe it's different, but we're not. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. And thinking about Stockwitz, how did you give it, how did you get involved with, with the Stockwitz? And then what essentially led to the, you transitioning into being the CEO of the company? Yeah. So, I mean, I've known Stockwitz for a long time, right? I was a early user of, of Twitter back in 07. And then I think I created my Stockwitz account in 2010. I mean, I was fortunate to meet one of the co-founders, Howard Lindzen, who's a well-known VC, and especially in the fintech world. And we met through a mutual friend and we just hit it off and became friendly. And so I was kind of in this Stockwitz ecosystem. They did events every year and I went many years or every other year, maybe if I could. And I knew the team over the years. And I was always fascinated by the platform. I, I love networks. I love communities and social and stuff. And so I'd always stayed in the kind of orbit of StockTwits and the StockTwits team. And as I mentioned, I was at Lawrence, Oregon. I was looking to kind of get back to, I think, real innovation. I mean, hey, a challenge of being in a 20,000, 25,000 person big public company is maybe you don't get to innovate at the speed or kind of the way I wanted to or or way I felt I had it in me till, still too. And that's where it kind of came up as a conversation with some of the StockTwits team. And ultimately, that's where the pitch came in to convince me to come join. Um, and what was exciting is you know, Stockwitz has, has been around a long time, right? It's not it's not a new startup in the last two or three years. It was four. It started in 09. And so, and it's organically built this amazing, highly engaged community, which in social is extremely hard to do, right? A lot of people try to pay to play and like you'll pay influencers and try to buy like this and that. And we've seen a lot of that in the recent cohorts, but finding real lightning in a bottle for real social is hard to do. And that's did that. And they had grown an amazing community. And what was really kind of exciting to me about the opportunity is, okay, how do we now deliver more value to this community? How do we build upon the conversation and the engagement in the form of the, the social feeds and whatnot, but now kind of complete or deliver more value around someone's trading journey and investing journey. And, and you know, what, when, when I was joining, like, I think that that excitement for me combined with some of the needs of stock to its operationally and to kind of get it, get it to where it needed, where it should be in 2020, obviously the COVID thing was a little bit of a, a little bit of a, 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 a wrench in the, in the works, right? But, but that, that, that's kind of what excited me to come over and, and kind of build the next chapter of StockTwits, uh, even though it's, yeah. you know, it has a better yeah. history. Yeah, it's always interesting, the, the transition of bringing on a new CEO. And we, we've chatted to both, we've chatted to companies on the show who've, who've had that experience themselves, who've been a part of that experience. And what, what ways do, you know, companies kind of set the expectations for their teams to make sure that the transitions are smooth, whether you're coming in in your position as someone who's an outside yeah. individual coming in as a CEO, or if you're the current founder and CEO and notifying that your team that you're bringing on other leadership for some of those more strategic goals, how do you make sure that, you know, what you said, the expectations and that the transition yeah. is a smooth one? Yeah, I mean, it's always tricky. And I don't even think it's just at the CEO level, right? I mean, at a lot of senior level, depending again on the size of the team, there's always a bit of a challenge there. Hey, you may be bringing on a new head of engineering or product or finance, whatever it might be, right? There's always, okay, how do we make sure we do this right? I mean, communication and why it's happening is I think always a really important first step to help everyone understand, okay, why, why are we making this change? What's going on? Being just very simple, concise, clear about that. You don't need to spend too many words on that. Spend, spend the right amount. Don't, right. don't try to obfuscate it or whatnot. So I think that's, that's step one. And then step two for the person coming in, myself in this case, it's, yeah. 
hey, what do we got to do, right? And, and what, in the case of the CEO, right, you're setting kind of the strategy and the vision for the company and being able to kind of help communicate that and, and share that with everybody is in a, in a, in a way that you're communicating, but you're also getting, taking the feedback. I mean, was at a loss for words there. Uh, I think size matters because for StockTwits, we're not again a huge company. So at our stage, when I took over, we were much, much smaller, right? So like yeah. when I took over at IG, you know, we, we had to go through, unfortunately, a reduction in force, like back in the early days of COVID and stuff. So really it was a much leaner team. It was about 15 people. And so it's, it's a lot easier to communicate and work and collaborate every day with 15 people than it would be in the 100 or 200 or 500 or 1,000, right? Whatever it might be be so for me the two main goals were hey why is this happening and okay what are we going to do from here and what 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 is kind of the strategy and vision and it doesn't yet you don't have to have it all figured out necessarily but here's where we're going towards here's what we're figuring out let's work together towards it and then listening especially in the early days you gotta kind of take the feedback in and the inputs in so yeah i don't you know i think you gotta you gotta just understand the people and the teams yeah there's so many things to consider in that. It, it seems like there's so many moving parts. And the more you understand in that experience and in that transition, it, it kind of, you, you kind of set it up better with, with that understanding, which is awesome to see that it, it's it's not extremely foreign. And if it's dealt the right way, it, it, it can be kind of a, a boost to the company in a lot of ways. And tell, tell us a little bit more about StockTwits and what the company is kind of focusing on. You've got over 6 million users. You've got yeah. so many active and, and new members joining the community and within a community space, like you mentioned, it's so tough to continue to keep people around, keep people engaged and offer that value. How have you gone to focus on offering value to your community outside of say, just having general information in a place where people can meet and things like that. And how do you foster a community without doing, honestly doing too much with a lot of companies, but they fail at, they fail in that regard of, of, you know, adding on new features that that are pay pr- plans and manipulating the business model in different ways that will leave leave the community yeah. with a different experience. But what ways are you focusing on building community and adding value now? Yeah, and to to that last part of what you just said, I will share. It's always difficult to evolve and change when you have a highly engaged, active community, right? Because sure. oftentimes they're they like what they like what's there maybe they want you know incremental fixes or tweaks or this or that but you know they're not looking for big massive change or material change necessarily but sometimes that's the best thing to do for the broader community and we see this all the time right ultimately like a lot of people hate change until they get used to it and then it's then it's all good not not that every change is right or perfect but so they i'll just make that one comment there for us yeah i mean i think we think about a couple key things one is again that the delivering more value on top of the conversation to our existing community, whether that's in the form of data and tools and content, or whether that's in the form of certain capabilities, like we launched our subsidiary broker dealer, ST Invest. We integrated that into the StockTwits product for the first time last year. And this year we're gonna be integrating more capabilities on that trading and execution side. But delivering more value across the investing life cycle, and, and I simplify that as a life cycle of ideation, to research, to execution, to portfolio management, and back to ideation. And for us, that loop has social at the heart of it because we are social and community first. And so how do we think about delivering value to help people come up with better ideas or new ideas to potentially research to invest in, right? And then how do we help them research it better? How do we help them leverage the community and the tribe depending on their style of investing, right? If you're a swing or momentum trader, you have one style versus a fundamental value investor, which has a completely different style and different needs. So delivering value in the form of tools and data and premium content, that's a big focus of ours this year. But then also social is hard, right? I mean, like I think everyone has kind of understood this from from Twitter, especially the kind of social we do, right? Where it's not just pictures and kind of sharing things amongst friends. It's about information and, and conversation or with, with people you may not know, but may have similar interests as you. And so we, we think a lot about like kind of the onboarding and discovery process of how do we help people all these millions of visitors that are coming to our sites and our apps every month, how do we help the newer ones better connect, better engage, get that, find that value from the platform. So the the things around what we call discovery, what many people would call discovery for the user is a big emphasis too, right? How do we more quickly get you to the things that would be interesting to you, depending on what kind of trader or investor you might be? 
Yeah. What are some of the biggest challenges that StockTwits faces today? I'll go back to one of the things I said earlier. StockTwits is a more mature business than it, just a new startup or whatnot. But our big challenge, and it's probably a little bit my fault, and I, I got to kind of keep improving on that, is focus, right? We have so much opportunity, but we, have, we, we are also resource constrained, right? I don't have unlimited resources and unlimited hearing and design and product talent and talent on our community teams and whatnot. So I think our our ability to kind of make sure focus and prioritize and make sure the things that we're working on are the right things to work on. Again, we're not going to be right 100% of the time, but we, we want to have a good batting average there. And, and I think more specifically, because we've grown so much over the, the course of the pandemic, we've definitely kind of grown and, and have a different scale of engagement and activity than we did beforehand. We have the same problems in social or similar problems in social as the companies that are significantly larger than us, right? Because once you reach a certain scale, all the problems in social look the same. And so we're working hard with fraction of a percent of the resources of the, the Twitters and the Facebooks and the Instagrams and stuff of the world to kind of make sure we're helping create a great place for our users and community. But it's it's hard, right? I mean, yeah. I will say that is one of the hardest things and people don't appreciate how hard it is. It's not a solvable problem per se. You yeah. have to just keep fighting the problem. Yeah. If everything goes well, what's the long-term vision for Stop Twits? I mean, if everything goes well, we are we are the global platform for individual traders and investors. And people are able to come there and they're able to connect and find their tribes of like-minded styles of investor, right-minded, like-minded goals in investing. That's another important thing. You could, me and you could have completely the same styles, but I might have my goals about like being around like building a fund for college for my kids or something. And yours might be saving for a down payment on a, on a house in LA or something. Yeah, right. Yeah. Um, so yeah. you know, it, there's a lot of things to align in investing that affects people's investing profile and stuff. But for us, the end goal looks like we are the global platform. And I think that's really important too, because the, the next generation, the millennials and the Gen Z's outside of the U S are huge, huge uh, components of, of our global society. And so making sure we are, we're building the next gen global platform for individuals to, to ultimately build wealth and, uh, and profit and have fun doing it. Yeah. I love that. I always love this next section. I call my founder FAQ. So I'm going to hit you with some rapid fire questions cool. and we'll see where we get. So first question I always love to ask really just to open it up is what's particularly hard about your job? What's particularly hard about my job, making sure how do I help my team and how do I not, how do I enable them versus kind of getting in their way and stuff. I think there's a balance there, especially at our size. So I think that that's definitely something I'm consciously thinking about a bunch. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Being that your platform relies so much on community and, and there's obviously their community guidelines and, and ways to address the community and communicate. How do you, how, how do you address bad actors or misinformation in a community driven company would and, and how do you do so with without i guess relinquishing someone's ability to speak freely on your platform because it, it's a challenging balance on what is allowed and what's not allowed or or or, or is it I, yeah i'm curious in, in what your perspective is on that well, I mean, you know, we, we have published you know, kind of community guidelines and we, we are refreshing those kind of on an ongoing basis, but we do have the kind of community guidelines of what you should do. And some stuff is easy and it's obvious, right? Like, Hey, you can't be on like threatening people and whatnot, but it's, that's not the hard stuff, right? The hard stuff is kind of the ones that are on the, the gray area in line. And we have kind of a few lines of defense against that. Our first is kind of a third party partners that provide us with technology to kind of help. And that's probably more around kind of the, the obvious obvious abusive stuff, kind of spam and things like that. But even that we're always looking kind of to improve and, and upgrade. The, the next layer is, is the community itself, right? We, we are actually actively working on giving the community better tools to help inform us about what's going on. And so how do we, how do we help the community help the community, yeah. right? Help themselves. Yeah. And so we, we have work to do there. We've been consciously like kind of building out and, and uh, tackling that problem as well. And then the final line is like kind of our, our community and support team, right? And now we don't have 
hundreds or even thousands of employees like some of the other bigger social platforms do. We have seven people on that team, but they're actively engaged and we're paying attention and, and we're reviewing all the reports that people are sending in and, and engaging and giving feedback to users, right? We try to be where a user may have crossed the line and maybe they don't think they did, but we, we actually give feedback. We don't, sure. it's not like always automated or something. I mean, there, there's that too, but and we'll suspend or temporarily like, hey, we'll kind of put you in timeout, right? And explain to them and and then if then let them back on if they're a good actor great and if they keep violating we we we, we take the next action that's necessary but it's hard and yeah. at scale it's really hard but we yeah. try to publish the rules and try to be as true to it as possible knowing that we're not going to be perfect and we're never going to be able to end like there's no finish line in this sure. in that race yeah yeah thinking about thinking about your experience and your background you've worked with institutions you've worked in, with retail investors and I'm curious, what gets you really excited about working with individual investors outside of working with institutions? And I have a few reasons, but obviously I'm, I'm an individual investor myself, amateur. But what gets you so excited about working with your, your current customer base? I mean, to me, what's exciting is we're closing the gap and we're working on closing the gap of information asymmetry, right? The information edge and advantage that institutions have historically had is getting smaller and smaller. Now they still have edges and they still have the advantage of resources to leverage those those advantages and edges. But I think as technology kind of continues its evolution and the cost of things keeps coming down, right? I mean, look at the progress in AI and obviously all the hype over the last few weeks or months around generative AI and open AI and chat GPT and GPT-4 now, right? There's there's a lot of, using that as an example, there's a lot of value to unlock that now becomes cost effective to deliver at the individual level. And so closing that gap of giving information and tools and helping people invest, because each generation has kind of fallen behind the previous generation in their exposure to investing and the markets. And the way the system is set up for us here in the U.S., right, is that there's really very few places left to build wealth. And, and the markets and investing is one of those few places. And, and we want to make sure everyone knows about it, has access to it, and can learn from the community because that's how people learn. I mean, the markets are very much an apprenticeship apprenticeship game to me. Yeah. and But that doesn't mean your best friend is going to be the person that you're going to learn from because they might have totally different needs or interests or whatnot. So how can we coll- enable you to find that tribe and, and c- give you the tools around it as well? Yeah, yeah. I'm so curious about your community in particular. What are some styles that, of investment that you've seen that you've particularly enjoyed kind of learning? And also, how have investing behaviors changed even in the recent years as the assets are becoming ones that people like to sell and trade? And people in terms of investing in companies are caring more about ESG and how companies really tackle the environment, their sustainability and thinking about that. Yeah, what are some styles that you particularly were interested or excited about learning? And then what are some behaviors that have changed? Well, so I've I've personally, and even actually most of my kind of career where I've spent actually on the institutional side more, um, I've always been in what I would put like a buy and hold investor bucket, right? I've, I've had my Microsoft stock for 20 plus years, I like to say now, right? And so I'm much more of a buy and hold, but what's actually been really exciting and interesting to me and what, what it always has been kind of interesting and exciting about StockFits is on the trading side where, you know, like a little bit more technical and data oriented, I've been just kind of following folks and like learning a lot more about that personally. And and I think it's important to learn about, even if you're a buy and hold person, because I think one message that gets lost or that isn't shared enough is a lot of people say, hey, just be in the markets and that's it, right? Like as long as you're in the markets, you're fine. As long as you're in for the long term, that is true in a very academic 100 year, 50 year time horizon kind of example. But in reality, entry points and exit points matter. And that's where like the technicals and the training help you a little bit better to be like, am I getting in at the right time? Because what if you bought at the peak of the dot com bubble, for example, and whatever you own, and then you didn't get back to par for I think it was like 13 years or something like that. I don't know the exact number. So 10 years is a long time in someone's life. And depending on where you are in your life stage, 13 years might really matter. I mean, if you're at 0% over 13 years, that's not the promise of that 10% annualized, 8% annualized. So 
for me, that's been exciting to kind of kind of just learn and see from people that are really good at the kind of technical side and training side, just what they think about it and how they look at it. That's been one. I'm a macro guy, so I love reading people that are kind of, especially right now, right? There's whew, got some of that stuff going on when, when it comes to the macro, like kind of global macro at this point with all the news going on in the world of banking and finance. But so those have been interesting to me. Yeah, yeah. Oh, being that you've had such a wealthy career in terms of the experience you've gained in, in as a founder, as a CEO, what's something that you've learned or that you know now that you wish you learned earlier on in your career? I, I, I picked this up a while ago, the last company I co-founded, Novus, but I'm an engineer by background, right? So I'm a, I'm a CS and double E. I'm a, I, I was a coder and CTO for a long time in my startups and stuff. And I enjoy it. I love the, the creativity, but also the building, right? And creating. Yeah. But one of the things I really took away at Novus, which was an enterprise SaaS kind of business, right? So I was the CTO and I was building the product, but I was also out there selling is sales, learning sales and learning about sales, not because necessarily you're going to be the best salesperson in the world and you got to get out there, but sales is really hard, but it is the lifeblood of kind of any activity and organization. So even if you're not on the sales team, like if you're on the product team or engineering team, you need to be able to sell your colleagues and your peers on ideas, strategies, product features, whatever it might be. So learning the psychology and art of selling and, and how to communicate from a sales kind of like lens and perspective, I think is super valuable for everybody. No, even if you'll never be in sales in your life, because you're always selling, even if it's just like, Hey, you're going for an interview for the most individualistic role in the world. I don't know what that would be, but you, that interview is still a selling process, right? To right. a degree. So that's the one thing I would always encourage everyone to do or figure out how to learn or get exposure to just to kind of have that experience. Cause sales is hard. It is the hardest thing I will say of everything. Cause sales is psychologically, you have to be ready for rejection 90 plus percent of the time. Yeah. Yeah. Agreed. And, and one founder said it really well in the show was that it's just about finding the story and how you really connect with your product, yeah. because it's going to be slightly different from everyone else. But the authenticity of it is definitely what communicates through through most messages. Right. And, and when you when you talk to different people about the product or what you're working on, it, it, it exudes that enthusiasm or at least it, it, it creates that buy in that, that the recipient Absolutely. feels. Yeah. I and love the word, story. Yeah. 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 Storytelling. Um, I love to ask this next question because I think founders and CEOs and individuals who build companies, I love how they extract knowledge from anything in their lives. So there's no, there's, there's no boundaries here, but if it, whether, whether it was early in your career or now, what books or people have influenced you the most? What books or people have influenced me the most? I I'll probably go the people route. I don't know if I'm going to name them, but I, I had a co-founder, colleague who's who's still a very good friend. And this goes a little bit to the sales aspect and the ability to, like his ability to connect with people and communicate and bring people together in a way that everyone felt like they were winning, right? Everyone felt like they were getting value out of it, but he was also getting value out of it, right? In some way, I think the learning that and being able to bring that to when you engage with other people, whether it's, and that, that applies to, you don't have to be in startups just for that, or you don't have to be a founder just for that. I think that ability to, Hey, it's me, you, Julian, and maybe we're in a room with two other people and we're talking about something, how am I able to like, connect everybody? Are we able to like make everyone feel like, all right, like we're all winning from this relationship and we're all learning or growing or whatever it might be and being able to do that. I'm not, I'm not the best at it and, and doing it in a way where, um, you're also kind of, you're, you're in the mix there. Right. I think that's, that's the big thing I take away. I'm still working on it. I'm not the best. Yeah. At it, but yeah. 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 Lifelong kind of pursuits. I love that. <laughs> I love that. I know we're coming close to the end of the episode and I want to give you a chance to give us your plugs and, and let us know where we can support and find you. But before I do that, my last yeah. question is, is there anything I didn't ask you that I should have, or that you would have liked to answer? No, I don't, I don't think so. I'll ask you a fun question. I like to ask people for music. You have to rank lyrics, beats, melodies in uh, order one through three. What do you do? Oh man. Lyrics, beats, melody in order one through three. Oh man. Oh gosh. That's a tough one. I'm a huge music person. I love it. I would go, I would go beats are number one because no matter what the rhythm of vibration will get you, whether you can understand the music or not, I would go with. 
melody because still with the language piece you can you can really just yeah. that, that's like the tune of the mind and it doesn't necessarily matter about the language piece it really just the vibration piece and the last is lyrics of course because i think once once you're once all of a sudden done and you're sitting by yourself listening to music then you really start to digest what the words are being said and and you kind of decide in that moment whether you still like the song or not i love it originally though thank you so much for asking me a question i appreciate that and um and it's been such an incredible time talking to you, not only learn about your experience, but what you're working on at Stock Twist. And tell us where we can find you, where we can find you as a founder, where we can find the company, start playing and, and being in the community, start to find our tribe. What are the websites? What are the LinkedIn's, Twitter's? Give us everything we need to know. Yeah, so on the Stock Twits and Twitter, you can find me at Arcana, simple enough. And uh, LinkedIn, I believe I'm Rishi Kana, full name. So you can uh, get me, hit me up in those spots. And what I'd say is, hey, if you are interested in the markets at all and want to know what the community is even talking about, we have some really like great features that make it accessible just to kind of keep track, like our what's trending on, on Stock Twits or our sentiment analysis of what's the sentiment of each stock or crypto or whatever. Give it a whirl, download the app or, or sign up and and give it a try and just to you know see the market and follow markets. Amazing. Rishi, it's been such a pleasure chatting with you. I hope you enjoyed yourself and thank you so much for being on the show today. Thanks a lot, Julian. It's been great chatting and hanging out with you too.